For those of you watching on television, please come visit with us at Antioch and Edgerly, 1030, Sunday morning. We'd love to have you. And for, for those of you that are here today, we're going to start in Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, 4. Let's all stand. 1 Samuel 8, 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. Father in heaven, we just ask you, Lord God, to bless this word today. Now, in Jesus' name, amen. Everybody be seated. You know, Israel was, wasn't like the other countries. They didn't have a king because God was their king. If they had a problem, they went to the preacher, Samuel, and Samuel would pray to God, and God would tell them what to do through Samuel. And they were the most prosperous. They were the, everything was wonderful. But they got a wild notion they wanted to be like other nations and have a king they could see. They wanted a man for a king. As it goes on, they said unto him, Behold, thou art old, thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all nations. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. You know, Samuel couldn't believe it. Man, they're going to turn their back on the Lord. They want to get rid of me. They want to get some man in here for a king like everybody else. Hasn't God been good enough to us? What more do they want? You know, he was just floored by it. But you know, folks, it's just like America today. We don't want a king that's going to follow God. We want somebody that's for abortion and gay marriage and hates God's chosen people and hates policemen. And Well, that's where we are today. We booted God out of here. We don't want God no more. And that's exactly what they were doing. We don't want God as king no more. Well, Samuel didn't like it because, you see, he knew what you know. When you get a wicked king, the country suffers. We're feeling it today. Well, again, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected you, they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Well, you know what? God understood fine. And just like you, you may witness to a relative or a loved one and they get mad at you or they get ugly with you. They're not being ugly with you. They're being ugly with God. You represent God and they don't want to hear what you got to say. And don't ever take it personal, folks, because it's God they're attacking. But you know what? God said, give them what they want. I've always read that about, about God in the Bible. He will give you what you want. And I'll tell you something. Whenever a nation wants a wicked king, he'll give them one. And then that nation suffers. And that's what they're about to do. Well, according to all that which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto you. You know, folks, it's just like today. You know what? He brought them out of Egypt across a desert and found, brought them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, he brought us across an ocean out of a country of tyranny into a land flowing with milk and honey. But now that we got the milk and honey, well, we don't need God no more. We want to do it our way now. We don't want to be bothered by all the rules and stuff that God had. Exactly the same thing. Well, look as it goes on. And you figure they served other gods? Well, look at us at our evolution today. Look at us at our secular humanism today. Look at the people with the horoscopes and the Ouija boards. Same thing. Well, as we go on, the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice, make them a king. Samuel said unto the men of Israel, go you every man to his city. Now, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zazar, Zerar, uh, named um, the son of Bacharoth, the son of Alphea, a, a Benjamite, I'm sorry for all the names, mighty men of power, very powerful men. Well, they had a son, and his name was Saul, a choice young man, a goodly, and there was none among the children of Israel goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any people. Oh, Saul was a nice-looking big fellow. When you put him in a crowd, he stuck up that higher than everybody else. You know, perfect subject for a king. Well, at least that's how men would look at it, you know. Well, now the Lord said unto Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee out a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him 
to be captain over my people Israel. And the, he said, they may save the people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. You know, a king has got to make decisions to keep you out of war. When war does happen, you're attacked. You've got to make the decisions to protect his people. And you know, <coughs> if you're right with God, you'll make the right decision. But this man never was right with God. You can see it from the very beginning. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spoke of, this shall reign over my people. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint the king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. <clears throat> One piece of advice the prophet gave the king. Listen to the words of God. Amen. Today in America we're scared to death of the words of God. They won't even say the name Jesus, you know. But you know if you're going to be a leader of the people, you've got to be in touch with the word of God. Amen. Folks, you know something? The word of God is your Bible. And today we've got leaders that want to do away with the Bible. They want to get rid of the Bible. Well, you sure don't want that for a leader. You want a born-again Christian to lead your country because God will show him what to do. Now, here we go. He's king now. And let's see if he's going to do right because you know what? God gave this guy everything. He had the health, the looks, and now he is the king over God's chosen people. That's quite a task. But you know, the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. Amen. Well, listen what goes on. In 1 Samuel 15, 2, I'm skipping all around. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that Amalek, what he did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way and when he came up from Egypt. Now you go and you smite Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and spare them not, but slay both the woman and the man the infant, <clears throat> the suckling, the ox, the sheep, the camel, the ass. You know, folks, people say, why would God make him kill the animals? These people were so immoral and ungodly, they were full of social diseases. They'd have all kinds of sexual misconduct, and, oh, man, they were, just, they were riddled with diseases. Even the animals were full of disease. Well, God didn't want to bring in that back to Israel, you know? Just like right now, we got an open southern border. And, you know, we had that COVID under control. But now, all of a sudden, it's worse than it ever was. I wonder if it's because we're bringing diseased people and strategically placing them in the middle of night all over America. We're bringing COVID back. Well, we're getting ready for another election, folks. But you know what? Listen to this. Listen to this. Saul gathered the people together, and they numbered them in Talium, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek, and he laid wait in the valley. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Hevelah unto they comest to Shur and over against Egypt. He went in there, and he slaughtered them. But you know the only problem? We saw a real pretty sheep that was fat. Oh, we're not going to kill that. Bring that with us. Oh, them camels, man, they were beautiful. Don't, don't, don't kill them pretty ones. Kill the ones with sores. Uh, kill them skinny cows. Bring the good cows with us. And then the worst thing, there was the king Agag, who was a wicked, wicked, ungodly devil. And God specifically said, kill him. But he said, you know, we could take a ransom for him and give it to the church. Folks, don't ever reason with what God tells you. God said, kill the sheep, the cows, the camels, the jackasses, kill them. But he reasoned, said, you know, we could bring these to the house of God and sacrifice these lambs. He wasn't thinking about God. Just like you and I, we always have an excuse for when we sin. And you know what? He didn't kill a gag. Now listen. But Saul and the people spared a gag, and the best of the sheep and the best of the oxen, the fatlings of the lambs, <coughs> and all that was good, all that looked good was healthy. <coughs> and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and full of sores, well, at that he refused and he destroyed utterly. Well, yeah, he didn't want the more crippled up sick ones with sores, so he killed them. Folks, that's not obeying God. When it comes to God, you don't pick and choose. You know, you believe all the Bible or you reject all the Bible. No such thing as picking and choosing. 
Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, I repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried to the Lord all night. You know, you might say, why would Samuel cry all night? That don't make Because he realized that everything we do has a consequence. Putting this man as king and him making these bad decisions right off the bat, it upset Samuel because he knew that a plague was coming to the people. You know, folks, I know today they've got these panty waist preachers, horn swoggle. They won't mention politics in the pulpit. The devil loves that because it just opens us wide up with no warning, no rhyme or reason. We just open ourselves up to be destroyed, and that's why. This preacher cried all night because he, unlike so many today, was concerned about his country. And he, unlike so many today, believed in the punishment of God. Well, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be the name of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. You know, it's so easy for you and I to make ourselves believe we're doing good. We have got a talent of ignoring our sin ignoring our bad personality traits. We can only see the good. Well, he could only see the good, but unfortunately God saw exactly what he did for real. Well, Samuel said, Well, then what meaneth this, the bleating of the sheep in my ear and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Well, if you killed everything, why am I hearing sheep over here bleating and the cows are mooing? What's up with that if they're supposed to be dead? As Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and hath given it to the neighbor of thine that is better than you. Oh, man, this hit Saul like a ton of bricks because he knew when Samuel said something, hey, it happened. Back in them days when a preacher said something, they were real men of God, and it happened when they said it. Well, then Samuel Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came out unto him delicately. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. You know what? He come out and he's joking and ribbing everybody because he thinks it's all okay now. He's going to get ransomed to another tribe of Amalekites and he'll be just fine. Little does he know he's dealing with a real man of God that does not compromise. He does what he knows is right, whether people like it or not. And you know what he did? Folks, this is gruesome, but he was a man of God. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Man, this man of God drew out a sword, and he went to hitting that king cut his arms off at the shoulders, cut him in half at the waist, cut his head off, cut his legs off. He showed the people this is what God can do. To He's a God of love. Yeah, he is a God of unbelievable love. But you rub God the wrong way, and he can become a God of wrath like your imagination can't imagine. And that was to show these people, first of all, you do not become the enemy to God. Second of all, king, you obey the words of God. You know, his throne room was full of white marble. And his throne was made of ivory and gold. And when he went to hacking on this man, that red blood splattered all over that white floor and all over Saul and all over the throne. That's to show something, folks. You don't want to infuriate God because he can take a, a gift that he's given you and turn it into a bloody mess. And that's what we see right here. He hacked him into pieces. Now, the Philistines gathered together, because here it comes, you see. The Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together as Shokah, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shokah and Azekah, and in Esedimimim, that's a hard name, and Saul and his men and Israel were gathered together, and they pitched in the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against Philistines. They're ready to go to war. For some reason, can't figure it out, 
Everything was fine, but now the Philistines have reared their ugly. It's kind of like America. Man, everything was fine. Look how many years we've been at peace. But you know what? we got a clown for a king. And look at China and look at Russia and look at Iran. They're rearing their ugly heads. Same as the Bible. The Philistines stood on a mountain and Israel on the other side of the mountain. There was a valley between them. <clears throat> they went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistine Goliath of Goth, whose height was six cubics in a span. You know, folks, everything was lovely, but now they got an army and a giant representing them. You get away from God, and he'll send an army against you, and there'll be a giant in your life that you won't know where it come from. <laughs> folks, you got to stick with God. You've got to be faithful. And what did he say? By every word that comes out of God's mouth, live by it. This giant was unbelievable. Then a little old kid, they're coming to bring some stuff to his brothers, and he's seen that giant roaring in the, in the valley down there. And I'm not going to tell that story because it's just here, and I'm going to tell you about it right quick. But that little boy went over and said, Man, why? what's going on? What y'all so scared of? Well, I'll tell you what they were scared of. The king got out of God's will, and they knew they were doomed. But that little kid said, Man, I'll fight. See, little David was a boy that was right with God. And little did Saul know, but that's who God sent to take over the kingdom. A little kid. But you know, that kid would face a lion with his bare hands and kill it. How? By prayer. Folks, you might have cancer or a divorce at your door or something even worse than all of that. Folks, you might have a lion at your door, but God can help you to kill that lion. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. Well, everybody tried to discourage him and say, son, you little knocky-kneed boy there. That guy's nine foot tall. But you know what? When you got God in your life, people don't scare you. I've took on a lot of projects. People say, you're crazy. You can't. No, I had God on my side, and the project worked out. Well, boy, when that giant come out there and roared, that little boy went run. He didn't run from it. He ran to it. You see, that's the difference. That's the difference between a lost person and a Christian. A lost person will go around trouble and pretend it's not there. But a Christian will face it head on, and he'll take it out of the way. And don't have to worry about it no more. Well, David ran, and he stood upon the Philistine because he just put a planted a rock between his eyes. And he took his sword, and he drew it out to the sheath thereof, and he slew him. He cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. You know, it's amazing how Saul got him in trouble, but an anointed kid come got him out. It's pretty easy for Saul to see this boy's fixing to take my job. Well, you know what? The people was starting to like this little boy, and that little boy started growing. He started going with them into battle, and he could become a young man. And when they come back from battle, they said, man, he killed 10,000 people by himself. And boy, Saul started getting jealous. Then he heard him chanting one day, Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. That put the icing on the cake. Oh, I got to kill that kid. You know it's something how... He started out working for God, but then he disobeyed God. And now he's gotten away from God, and now he's the enemy of God's plan and God's servant. Isn't that amazing? And Saul was very wroth at the saying. It displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David 10,000, and to me they have ascribed but 1,000. Yeah, what can I do? He's going to take my kingdom. Oh, he saw it coming. And Saul eyed David from that day forward. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. He's against the man of God. Look at this world, folks. You get somebody, a governor or a, a, a president that is godly, and the news media will chew them up. The movie stars and the athletes will grind them into powder. Why? Well, just like what we're reading right here. The devil has eyed them since the day they took power and tried to bring God back. It came to pass on the morrow 
that an evil spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied in the midst of the house. He's wandering around mumbling stuff and saying all kinds of things. You can see that Saul is losing his mind. You know, folks, when God leaves you, you lose your mind. And David played with his hand and the heart and other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast that javelin and said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David, a boy, he jumped out of the way. And man, from then on, man, he avoided the king. You know, this boy never did try to get back at the king. He didn't go behind him and talk about him. He just avoided him. Because oddly enough, he loved the king. But the king hated him. That's how it is, folks. When you're Christian, you love the world. And you want people to be saved. But the world hates Christianity. But it all goes back to the beginning. It's not you they hate. It's the one that sent you. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. And Saul spake to Jonathan, his son, <coughs> excuse me, and all his servants, that they should kill David. He is working now and sending all his people out to kill the man of God, the anointed man of God. Wow. Now Samuel's dead. Samuel died in that period of time. The prophet died. And all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even his own city. And Saul put away those that had familiar spirits, wizards. and out of the See, when Saul was right with God, he did all kinds of good stuff because Samuel was telling him what to do. Samuel said, we've got to get rid of all these devil worshipers and wizards and witches. You know, today we embrace that. We've got the Ouija board and the tarot cards, and you've got Chloe there, and, you know, all these sayers and seers and... Folks, I hate to tell you, but that horoscope on down is nothing but witchcraft. That's what it is. And if you're choosing that over God, you're making a big mistake. Well, here Samuel's gone. And before, as I said, Saul put all the devil worshipers out of the country, but now he's lost. He's lost. It ain't like now. You're not sealed until the day of redemption. Back in them days, you served God, you worked for God. It's a different a dispensation. But you know what he did? He wanted to talk to Samuel. He didn't know what to do. You know, before, Samuel told him what to do, but he disobeyed. But now he wants to talk. You know, it reminds me so much of people. And, folks, I, I get so frustrated. People will come to me. They're having marital problems. And I've told you this a million times. Well, what happened, son? Well, uh, night before last, I got real drunk, and I beat my, beat my old lady. She's left me now. She's going to be with her mama. Okay, well, let me tell you what you do. Don't get drunk no more and beat your old lady. It'll all be fine. And a week later, my phone will ring. Oh, Russell, I beat my wife. You here come and talk to me. If you don't do what I say, then what you calling me for? Either follow the Bible that I'm going to read to you or leave me alone and let me watch gun smoke. <laughs> well, you know what? He goes to a devil-worshiping woman, and he asks her to do a seance and bring up Samuel to talk to him. Then this guy has fell off the wagon, you hear me? Well, here we go. And Saul said unto the servants, Seek me a woman that hath familiar spirits. What that means is, you know, they conjure up somebody you know that's been dead. The Bible said, Do not fool with familiar spirits. Folks, let me tell y'all something. If you passed away, Grandpa or Mama appears at the foot of your bed one night, pull the covers up over your head and start praying. Because it's not Momo. It's not your brother. It's not your daddy. They're with God or they're burning in hell, and they're not in your bedroom. The Bible's very clear of that. He, the devil will send you somebody that looks like Mama to tell you stuff that's not correct. Now, don't get me wrong. Someone may pass away in your family. You pray for God for confirmation that they're okay. God will give you that. I believe that. I believe God will do things like that to, so you don't worry about them and you'll know they're okay. But for us, for a dead person coming from the grave and giving you advice and telling you what to do, you avoid that and you leave that alone because it's not of God. Well, anyway, Saul sent his servant, got him a woman with familiar spirits, that I may go to her and inquire of her. 
And his servants said unto him, Behold, there's a woman that has familiar spirits in Endor. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up to thee? He said, Bring me up Samuel. And the woman, when she saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. She's in the seance, and she sees Samuel or something coming out of a grave. And the woman screamed, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? You're Saul. You see, when she was in a trance, she knew. Folks, let me tell you something. Witchcraft is real. It is. It's of the devil, and it's real. When she was in this trance, she knew that that was the king. And she freaked out. He said, don't worry, I'm not him no more. I'm a lost goose now. That's back when I was with God. Now I'm on your side with the devils. Why hast thou just deceived me? You are Saul. And the king said, be not afraid. For what did you see? Tell me what you saw. The woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. You know, folks, this God is a little G. This is not God that we know. You've got to understand, Satan is called the God of this world. And all the devils that are with him are little gods. They're not the God, but they're little gods. And this woman's seen him coming up and down out of the graveyard, out of the earth. He said unto her, what form is he? In other words, what does Samuel look like now? She said, an old man cometh up, and he's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived. He perceived that it was Samuel. It wasn't Samuel, folks. This was a demon pretending to be Samuel. He stooped down to his face to the ground. He bowed himself. And Samuel said unto Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me and brought me up? First of all, Samuel said, Why have you brought me down? Samuel ain't in hell. Samuel ain't in the grave. This is the devil. And Saul answered, I am sore distressed. For the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me. Oh, and dreams, therefore I call thee, that thou mayest make known to me, what shall I do? Well, you know, Saul basically said, I mean, Samuel basically said to Saul, well, friend, your goose is cooked. You're finished, and Israel is fixing to take a whooping because of you, and you have went off the deep end, fellow. Now, the Philistines fought against Israel. The men of Israel fled from the Philistines. You know something? All his men run away. You know, I've read in books that to make a great general, one thing you had to have is the ability to make your men stick with you. Because when a general would come over the hill with 1,000 men and there's 10,000 enemy, well, he would soon find out, hey, where did everybody go? They ran the other way. Well, you see, folks, he don't have God no more, and all the men know it. And there's all them Philistines, and all the Israelites ran away because they knew they were fighting the battle without God, and that couldn't be done. Now, the Philistines followed hard upon Samuel, on Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abedinadad and Malachisa. All of Saul's sons killed them, wiped them out. You know something, folks? You might think you can steal a sheep from God. Don't ever take nothing from God because the price you pay. You know, folks, I, I'm a real believer in that. I've known people that, I mean, it's happened to this church here. Had a bookkeeper one time that stole every penny this little church had. And I mean, I'm not judging her, but God would deal with that. But I'm just saying you do not mess with God. And the battle was sore against Saul. Things were not going good. And the archers hit him. And he was sore wounded by the archers. He's got an arrow in his chest and he's in trouble now. Saul said unto his armor bearer, draw thy sword and thrust it through in me. Lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. He says, man, you got to kill me. They catch me. They're going to torture me. They're going to cut my hands and feet off. Oh, you got you to you gotta kill me, man. But the armor bearer said, I ain't killing you. You're the king. You know, folks, sometimes there's rules that you don't break. To end this story, poor old Saul, away from God, without God, abandoned by his army, got an arrow stuck in his chest. He can't even find nobody to kill him. So he has to take his sword and fall on it. Folks, this is a simple lesson. This is a true story. 
But it tells you and I, God will give you everything, but you better listen to him. God will open up heaven and pour the blessings out upon you. But you better be reading your Bible. You need to be in church on Sunday morning thanking God for what you got. It's so easy to forget God when we don't need him anymore. Well, folks, I got news for you. You need him, and I need him. America needs him. The world needs him. And there will never be a day that we don't need God. But there are stupid people that think they don't need him. Well, thank God I'm not one of them. I know I need God. And I try my best to do his will and to follow his word and to read his Bible and not twist it, make it say what I want it to say like so many religions today are doing. People leave this church and they go get off in these old occults. Oh, and they tell me how wonderful it is. Oh, they just they get in the spirit and fall on the floor and don't know who they are. And a year later, they're back drinking and smoking dope and staying in the saloons. I've seen it for years. You can't play games with God. You can't play games with church and with the Bible. Today, if you're sitting in this church, you're here because God sent you here. And folks, you may not realize it, but it's essential that you're loyal to your church family. This is your church. I mean, it's Jesus' church. But he died to give it to you. And you're here today. You just didn't stumble in here one day out of the cold. God sent you here to be part of this, this army. And we're going to do our best to follow God's letter to the law. We're going to obey him. And we're going to do the right thing. And we're going to expect God's blessing. And as I said before, whenever a country gets a bad king, the Bible said, the people mourn. When you get a good godly king, the people rejoice. We've seen it. We've been there. Right now, this country is in trouble. The world's in trouble. They're ganging up on us. The shelves in the store are empty. I was watching this morning news. They're putting less cereal in the box and going up on the price. And it ain't just cereal, it's everything. You know, it's something how, you know, a couple years ago, that particular party wanted to take God and God we trust off of their emblem. I don't know if y'all remember that or not. But you see, folks, they showed their true colors back then. You can't have America without God. You know what George Washington said? America is the type of country that is made for moral Christian people. And without them moral Christian people, this country cannot stand. You know, they said, John, and several of them said it, the Constitution was written for a Christian moral people, and it will only work if that nation it represents are Christians. Why do you think the devil is working so hard today to take Christ out of our country? That's why, folks. This critical race theory is teaching our kids to... to hate who they are, and teaching other kids to believe they're failures born that way. The most upsetting thing is teaching us to get away from God, that Christians are bad people. We come here and stole this land from the Indian. Folks, study up on your history. When the Sioux had it, the crows killed all the Sioux and took it. And then the Takapaw came and killed all the Navajo and took theirs. That's how that worked. And then you know what? We were stronger, and we came, and it was our turn. And you know, <clears throat> Americans don't realize it, but the American Indian did. They plainly said, it's no longer our time. It's time for the European white man now, just like we took it from the crow, and the crow took it from the Sioux, and the Sioux took it from the Apache, and the Apache killed all the... That's how it worked, folks. But today we're here, and we're led by God. We don't ask the horned toad which way to go. That's why we have America now, because God gave it to us. You know, it's amazing. It amazes me. If you study history, you'd be amazed how God took a man named Christopher Columbus. We've got a minute or two, so I'm just going to. Led him to this great place. And he knew all along God's leading me for a land for Christians. Why do you think they're taking his statue down everywhere? Because God sent him to give us this. The devil hates his guts. 
Why well, do you think they're taking Abraham Lincoln down when he freed the slaves? He's the one that penned the Emancipation Proclamation. They're taking his statue down. These people are goofy. You hear me? They just took the one in New York down. It was a Teddy Roosevelt. Had an engine on one side and a black tracker on the other side. These people was helping him conquer this country and find his way through. Oh, it's demeaning because he was on a horse and they were walking. So they took it down last week. No, folks, these people had God in their heart. And you know, so yeah, they wasn't perfect. They, well, I know they wasn't, and neither are we. Show me a perfect man, and if his name ain't Jesus, he ain't perfect. But our forefathers were great men of God. That's why they want to erase our history. Because they don't want God to get the glory. And that's why we see America deteriorating. The crime is running rampant. You know, folks, it breaks my heart. They're killing these police officers. Every day they kill one. Or two or three or four. And people don't realize these are people with kids at home and a wife crying herself to sleep at night. People don't realize that. Oh, it's a cop. No, it's not. It's a person. A person that has a unique job, that has a unique ability to perform that job. You know, folks, I've said it before. Not just anybody can be a doctor. Can you imagine taking a scalpel and cutting somebody's belly open and <laughs> comes up like a watermelon? And I don't know if you've ever been around that, but I'm going to tell you, it don't smell too good. It takes a special person to be a doctor, folks. You take all the lawyers and stuff, well, they can think. Firemen. No, I wouldn't be a fireman for all the beans in Boston, man. Got to run in that burning building and get that kid out of there when things are falling down. It takes a special person to do that. <laughs> but you know something? God filled America up with special people. You know, I believe we'd have a cure for cancer right now. But I truly believe we aborted the baby that was going to be the doctor to find the cure. We killed it. That was our punishment for doing that. America would be a lot more prosperous if we'd have stuck with God like our forefathers. You know, we first come to America in a school, what the books were? Well, there's only one, the Bible. They taught reading and writing and arithmetic with the Bible. But now they've convinced us our forefathers wanted separation of church and state, which is not in the Constitution anywhere. Only thing we have in the Bill of Rights is says in no way will the government mess with our religion. And they use that to take our religion away. Go figure that one out. But folks, because we got some evil kings that want to destroy this great nation, flowing with milk and honey. Why? Because it was a gift from God. Just like your salvation. People don't want to talk about being saved. Most preachers won't even say get saved. Hardly none of them will say born again. They scared somebody's going to laugh at them or make a joke about them. But the most important thing you can ever do is accept that gift of eternal life that Jesus gave you. Because nothing else matters, folks. Your soul, it's eternal. So if you've never been saved, I can't beg you enough to make that decision today. Let us pray. Father in glory, we thank you for your holy word today. Thank you, Lord, that you used old Saul to be an example for us to follow, to not be like him, not make the mistakes he made. Father, if there's one here today that's lost, let him come get saved. And Thank you, Lord, for America. Truly, you've blessed us with a land of milk and honey for the Christians to flourish. And we can't thank you enough, Father. Bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone.